Well, thank you very much, Leo and, uh, and Jackie, uh, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, what um, uh, I wanted to talk about this uh, time, uh, the last couple of times we did, I did kind of lectures and things like that, uh, which I think people found uh, interesting because a lot of people don't understand the full spectrum of neurological diseases which, be, which can occur in sarcoidosis. Um, and uh, we, we've gone through that and then there are very nice um, uh, uh, information um, on all the, uh, the, the websites that Leo has mentioned as well. But I'm going to go through, just in case anyone is potentially uh, 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 disappointed that I'm not going to do that as well. As I go through treatment, uh, I'm going to uh, allude to these um, uh, different uh, features. And so hopefully everyone will gather the information that, uh, that they, they, they're hoping to, uh, to get from this. But treatment um, is, uh, I wanted to focus on treatment uh, for two reasons really. One is that we, uh, we understand it uh, uh, much better now. Uh, we do have uh, policies arranged which have been published and agreed on and, um, uh, and we do have, um, we're developing networks of, uh, of other inflammatory neurologists who want to learn about um, uh, the treatment of sarcoidosis as well. NHS England is involved in all of this as well and, and there are working groups that were trying to get moving again after obviously stopping last year, uh, which will help us um, regionalize uh, centers of expertise, um, which I think is going to be very helpful um, uh, as well. Um, and also then uh, uh, increase an average um, uh, high standard um, of, um, of neurological care that patients um, who've got these um, uh, neurological complications will be able to uh, receive. Um, so doctors, you know, diagnose things and they throw pills at people. And of course, the pills that we need to use for, uh, particularly for sarcoidosis, are, are complicated, uh, toxic, uh, occasionally literally poisonous. Um, and, um, uh, but, uh, you know, and obviously it, it helps to, to get people better, but increasingly and very slowly doctors have been um, uh, gathering together an understanding of, of other aspects of, uh, of what are, I suppose, holistic forms of uh, treatment. Um, and I'm very pleased that we're um, gathering together this information. And a lot of the, if, if you want to say that uh, the COVID catastrophe has uh, provoked benefits, well, it certainly has. You know, we, we understand uh, inflammation in the body uh, more because of the searches being done with COVID. We understand how to create uh, um, uh, very important new generation vaccines, you know, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, for example, uh, which we would never have got done uh, uh, so quickly had it not been for COVID. And the last thing is uh, to understand um, uh, why certain people get inflammatory conditions, and, and don't forget, and I'm sure everybody understands this, that COVID is not just a viral infection, it is a uh, a, a vile uh, infection which elicits an inflammatory response, uh, which has um, uh, which which has some um, uh, crossover with with how autoimmunity damages uh, uh, body tissues. Um, uh, we, we've learned that uh, things like um, uh, pre-existing diseases. Um, uh, the degree to which people are uh, physically or not physically fit, the kind of diets they've eaten prior to becoming unwell, uh, and a variety of other things uh, is extremely important. And uh, that's why I'm so thrilled that uh, Professor Brewer is talking uh, to us today, because of course he spent uh, his whole uh, academic life um, studying um, the physiology of uh, uh, fitness and, uh, and nutrition and, uh, and exercise and, and things like that. Uh, and this is going to be an increasing, uh, at least I hope it uh, becomes an increasing um, uh, part of the treatment regime uh, that hospital uh, consultants and uh, specialist nurses um, and um, uh, charity advisors will be able to pass this information on to patients, which is going to augment the, um, the medical uh, aspects of treatment um, uh, uh, in a way which allows people to improve uh, uh, and recover uh, much more quickly. Uh, 
So this is why I'm excited about today because I think you know my my talk is going to run through the um, uh, the the medical parts of things um, and hopefully people find it interesting. But I think the main talk is going to be Professor Brewer's, which I think people uh, uh, will learn a great deal uh, from, uh, and I think it's going to be very helpful uh, moving forward, um, uh, particularly if, for example. Um, uh, Sarcoidosis UK would, uh, for, for example, agree to fund research, which is perhaps less scientific, but more actually holistic, uh, which would help us to define uh, a treatment pathway, which is going to get people better with all forms of sarcoidosis better much, much more quickly. Conceivably, it'll mean that people like me have to poison their patients less and less because they, they, uh, they don't get such severe forms of the disease. So this is what we're hoping to, to begin with, uh, with our discussions today. Uh, so the first slide, please, Leo. Okay, so uh, just uh, uh, these are the main categories of, of neurological involvement by um, sarcoidosis. Um, uh, Fifty percent of people with uh, neurosarcoidosis have a, a usually straightforward uh, condition, which is called cranial neuropathy. The cranial nerves are the nerves which come straight out of the brain uh, and affect predominantly uh, the the, um, uh, the neurological structures of the head. So the first one uh, looks after um, smell, the second one looks after taste and so on. And, uh, and everybody uh, will know that one of the most common cranial neuropathies uh, is a facial neuropathy. 50% of people with uh, cranial neuropathies get facial neuropathies, which can be um, either um, uh, on one side or, or even on both. Sometimes they alternate, sometimes they repeat. Sometimes uh, they happen at the beginning of the illness. Uh, such as Hereford syndrome, for example, um, uh, and sometimes they happen um, during uh, the, uh, the illness. And happily, uh, the majority of patients uh, with cranial neuropathy don't go on to develop more um, uh, sinister and complicated forms of, um, of neurosarcoidosis. There are, of course, many exceptions. I'm just saying the majority, it would be about 70% of people uh, would not have other manifestations of, of neurosarcoidosis. But part of it, as we'll discuss in a minute, um, is um, um, uh, how skillful uh, the treating physician is at understanding uh, the underlying disease and making sure that it is suppressed by the appropriate form of treatment. Leptomeningitis refers uh, to um, uh, the worst form of, uh, of neurosarcoidosis in which um, uh, inflammation develops in the lining of the brain, which then passes directly into the brain, uh, can cause um, uh, all the, the problems that we're going to uh, discuss and the scans I'm going to show in a moment. Um, and uh, it requires very urgent treatment, as I'll mention, um, and it can affect uh, the brain, uh, the pituitary gland, uh, the brain stem, uh, the um, spinal cord, uh, and also then the nerve roots coming off the spinal cord as well. Pachymeningitis uh, is an inflammation of the dura. The dura is the fibrous um, um, shell of uh, the nervous system. Uh, uh, which uh, protects it for the obvious reasons, uh, allows fluid to remain within it, it uh, prevents um, uh, abnormal um, uh, things like infections from getting in it, often but not always. Um, and so it's a very important structure. And people with hepachymeningitis, as I'll show you in a, uh, in a moment, um, uh, can develop uh, nodules of inflammation which can press on the brain or the spinal cord and cause various problems. Headache is a particularly prominent uh, aspect of, of, of pachymeningitis. <clears throat> Vasculitis um, is increasingly uh, recognized. Uh, if I'd given uh, uh, this talk about five years ago, I would have said, well, some people say that, um, you know, strokes and hemorrhages can occur. It's not very common uh, and we don't really understand if it's related directly to sarcoidosis or not. Um, and we now uh, understand very clearly uh, that it is, uh, and I'm going to discuss this in, in detail because the, the, the treatment regime for people with uh, the leptomeningitis and the vasculitis um, uh, is extremely important. 
<laughs> and I'm going to talk about um, uh, another condition which uh, a lot of patients who come to see me are frustrated about um, uh, where um, uh, they've got neurological symptoms, uh, they've got neurological signs, uh, the, the, uh, the doctors arrange uh, tests and say, well, good news, there's no sign of any problem on the, uh, on the brain scans, uh, you're obviously fine. And, um, uh, and then they, they, their symptoms either progressively worsen and deteriorate or they wax and they wane. Um, and uh, they happily, as I will discuss, they, they do respond uh, uh, to treatment. Neuropathy is much less common. Uh, the early studies used to say that about 10% of people with neurosarcoidosis uh, get neuropathy. That's really not my experience at all. I would put it at less than 5%, uh, but I'll discuss uh, the, um, uh, the various uh, symptoms which can develop um, uh, and uh, the treatment that, uh, that I've decided is, is helpful for that form of the condition. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. Okay. Uh, so the, um, the cartoon on the uh, right side um, is a, a, a kind of very brief um, explanation for what happens uh, whenever inflammation uh, develops, which then uh, transforms into a very particular form of inflammation, which we call granulomatous inflammation. Basically what happens in all uh, immune diseases either autoimmune or diseases uh, caused by uh, infections such as viruses and uh, bacteria uh, and fungi. Um, uh, the the uh, memory cells of um, uh, the, uh, the lymphatic system uh, recognize that there's something uh, there in the body which needs to be dealt with. Uh, it causes various changes, which is called activation of uh, white blood cells, uh, particularly T cells, but also B cells and a variety of other cells, which then lead uh, to the development of inflammation um, mediated through macrophages. Now macrophages are um, uh, the, um, uh, the um, transformed um, cells, which are meant to um, uh, eat up uh, the, the foreign uh, abnormality, the virus or the, or the bacterium or, or, or the fungus. And of course, in an autoimmune condition, uh, there isn't anything there to, to eat up. And so the problem is then that the macrophages then are told uh, to eat up uh, normal tissues. So the macrophages are, are the, um, uh, the cells in the middle of a granuloma. They're surrounded by these lymphocytes, which are the white blood cells. Um, uh, and then these in turn then uh, spread and multiply. Um, and then if someone has a fibrotic form of the condition, and of course not everybody does, then you get um, fibrosis and other uh, problems uh, uh, leading to um, a reduction in the severity of the, uh, the condition. But in others, uh, you don't get fibrosis um, and the condition just worsens and worsens and worsens. So they're basically um, uh, three different forms of sarcoidosis. One would be a, a, an acute um, self-limiting uh, condition. Uh, which resolves either with treatment or on its own. The second would be um, a relapsing and remitting form of the condition, which is often less well recognized by, um, uh, by uh, 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 GPs and hospital doctors because it can sometimes come back quietly and not necessarily affect the same tissue as affected at the beginning. Um, and then the third, um, most people with neurological involvement are form this category, uh, the condition uh, uh, never goes away and it uh, worsens and deteriorates and become quite severe. So the treatments that we give uh, include um, uh, corticosteroids, uh, which remove inflammation but don't affect the disease in any way, uh, and then various um, uh, 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 suppressive medications uh, which can influence uh, the, um, uh, the way in which uh, the disease uh, acts. So steroids are very important in granulomatous disease. Those of you who have had symptoms will know that steroids tend to work very quickly uh, and they improve the symptoms noticeably, even within days. Um, uh, but the problem is that uh, as soon as the steroids come down or stop, then the condition can just come straight back again. You often have this yo-yo effect of feeling better, then feeling worse, the steroids are put up again, then you feel better, and then they're put down, so you feel worse again. Um, and it takes a long, long time for the condition uh, to settle if steroids are used on their own for uh, conditions uh, in which um, uh, immune suppression is necessary. And, and we're talking about the neurological forms. Most of the neurological forms require this. 
this. So then the immune suppression then obviously then gets at the source of the uh, immune activation. So it gets at preventing the white blood cells and the macrophages from forming the granulomatous inflammation. And they usually do that very successfully. Um, uh, azathioprine, uh, methotrexate, mycophenolate, uh, 6 mecaptopurine there are things called um, uh, calcineurin inhibitors as well, like tacrolimus and serolimus, which are quite good, but which have a lot of side effects as well. These are often, alongside steroids, uh, all that is required uh, to settle down a condition like sarcoidosis. But then others uh, do have more severe forms. And then thankfully, uh, we have again uh, access uh, to uh, treatment uh, with uh, intravenous stem therapy, such as TNF alpha blockers, of which infliximab is the main one. Um, uh, which, um, uh, which uh, again, having been stopped for us for a while in the health service, are, are now allowing us to, uh, to treat people with more severe forms of the condition, uh, thankfully very successfully. We do have other uh, um, uh, medications as well, which aren't uh, yet available in the, uh, um, uh, the UK um, health service, but uh, have been shown to be helpful uh, in studies in other countries like France and in America, uh, which block off um, a cytokine called IL-2. Um, uh, uh, and then uh, there's another one uh, uh, um, called tocilizumab, which blocks IL-6, which has been shown to be helpful if um, on the rare occasions that infliximab um, isn't helpful. And then CD20 blockers, of which the most uh, uh, easily recognized is rituximab, um, is sometimes helpful again if um, uh, people can't take TNF-alpha blockers uh, due to allergy, for example, or uh, due to toxic effects, then we can use these other ones. But in the, in, in the National Health Service, it's more complicated nowadays to get them uh, because we don't have policies for their use in sarcoidosis. And so then it's often down uh, to going through uh, 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 several, not just one, but several uh, committees uh, allowing us to fund these kinds of uh, treatment on an individual patient basis. We're very excited about some very new drugs, uh, which are called immune checkpoint inhibitors, which have developed, been developed for cancer treatment, um, which do have anti-immune uh, effects as well. Uh, and uh, um, there has um, been a couple of uh, reports of immune checkpoint inhibitors being used um, in sarcoidosis uh, so far uh, with a beneficial effect, but obviously more work needs to be done. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. So that's the, the medical part. And then the lifestyle part then, uh, well, I've kind of said this already, actually, I was meant to um, uh, keep this to this slide really, but um, you know, changes in lifestyle are very important. It's not to say that uh, people with uh, sarcoidosis have got an abnormal lifestyle. It's just that it's time, whenever your body is put under stress um, uh, uh, with a, a disease, and of course, don't forget that the body is also put under stress with the treatment of the immune disease as well, then it's worthwhile considering uh, whether or not any changes in lifestyle uh, would be warranted. Now, this would include specific things as we've already discussed, uh, like uh, improving fitness when it is possible uh, to do so. And of course, people with lung diseases and neurological disease often find it difficult to, you know, to do normal kind of fitness things like running and swimming and things like that. But of course, there are other ways of, of doing it. Uh, and then diet as well, uh, as we're going to hear later on, uh, is extremely important. But then there are other aspects of um, uh, uh, dealing uh, with a, a chronic and complicated uh, and rare uh, condition. And that includes um, uh, understanding it uh, more. Uh, and this is where uh, this patient day comes in. And this is why the extraordinarily uh, improving uh, work that sarcoidosis is, UK is, is doing um, uh, for their patients uh, nowadays is, is coming to the fore. Um, sharing with others, understanding what the disease is, hearing how other people have gained access to treatments which have been helpful, uh, that the, the patient may not have um, uh, been uh, allowed to, uh, to understand was available. And then other um, uh, psychological factors as well, um, you know, understanding that they're not alone and, uh, and working out ways to, uh, to, to uh, ameliorate stress and, and worry uh, whenever uh, you're concerned about what effect the, uh, the disease has had on your, um, yourself, uh, your role in the family. 
uh, your role in, in society as well. And, and, and these things are often overlooked by, uh, particularly by hospital uh, doctors. Thankfully, GPs understand this much better than, uh, than, than hospital doctors do. Um, but again, there are changes um, in the health service, which means that patients don't always get access to this traditional kind of uh, treatment, uh, which is so helpful as well. Uh, next slide, please, um, Leo. Okay, so I'm just going to talk then specifically about uh, the um, uh, each individual um, um, uh, category that I that I've um, uh, that I've introduced earlier on. Um, so, uh, the cranial nerves. Uh, then um, uh, there are twelve of them, uh, um, uh, two of each, um, uh, and um, uh, they look after all of the important senses like smell and taste and vision and hearing and balance. Uh, and how the face works, and how the uh, the mouth works, and how the tongue works, and how swallowing occurs, and uh, all of these things. Cranial neuropathy, as I've mentioned already, um, uh, affects 50% of all cases of patients with neurological involvement in sarcoid. Uh, and by the way, uh, I should have said this at the beginning, 5% um, uh, of all people with sarcoidosis get neurological involvement. So 50% of those 5% get cranial neuropathies, 50% of those, 50% of the 5% get facial neuropathies, um, but any other cranial nerve can be affected either on its own or in a combination. Um, the, the two slides I've shown, obviously these are brain scans, the one on the top, uh, you, uh, uh, you may be able to see uh, that um, in the middle there is a kind of a, a not a very, it's a sort of trapezoid kind of bump in the brain. This is the brain stem. Can you see on the on the right-hand side of the picture, which is the left-hand side of the, the person's brain, uh, there's a bright area. This is a, a nerve, which is the facial nerve, which um, comes out of that area and goes through the uh, base of the skull uh, um, uh, and then into the face where it uh, divides up into lots of different branches, which uh, allow you to move the face on each side and uh, allow you to make facial expressions and talk and all sorts of important things. Uh, the one at the bottom uh, is the optic nerve and you can see that again on the right side of the picture but the left uh, the eye of the patient uh, there is that bright area uh, which is the optic nerve uh, in between the two bright muscles that you can see. Uh, the bright area is the abnormal area uh, and a, a patient such as this would have diminishment of, of uh, vision. Uh, which uh, thankfully does respond well uh, to, uh, to treatment. So the treatment of, of patients with cranial neuropathy uh, basically involves um, uh, how severe it is uh, and whether or not it's a single event uh, and whether or not it is associated with other uh, systemic manifestations. So it's very common, as I've said already, for you to get a facial neuropathy at the beginning of the disease or very quickly into the beginning of the disease within the first uh, couple of months, for example. It can also uh, occur um, whenever the disease having been settled then starts to come back again. Uh, and so we normally um, uh, treat it with steroids uh, on its own if it's the beginning, whilst the respiratory uh, people are, are uh, diagnosing the disorder um, and uh, defining its, how widespread it is and how severe it is. And then uh, it, it's okay then uh, to give people steroids and then to watch them carefully. And then if the facial neuropathy or the other neuropathy gets better, then um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the other doctors then who look after lungs and livers and skin and eyes and everything else, uh, then can define the, the treatment. And if everything settles down uh, and the sarcoid goes away, then uh, hooray for that. And, and patients don't need to have any other uh, treatment, but if the, the condition uh, worsens despite the steroid treatment, then we need to move on uh, to uh, um, other forms of, uh, of treatment, including suppressing the uh, immune system. So that's what I mean by uh, restaging uh, the disease and either escalating or recommencing uh, uh, treatment. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. So leptomeningitis is a completely different um, uh, ball game, as they say in America. Um, uh, leptomeningitis means uh, that the inner lining of the brain has been affected. 
uh, it is a meningitis, uh, not the kind of meningitis that babies get, uh, because that's a uh, bacterial form of meningitis, uh, but it's a meningitis uh, which spreads into the, the brain. And, and as you can see with the two MRI scans there, uh, again, um, the bright areas are the abnormal areas, and you can see uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, in each case, these are two different people, um, uh, there are um, areas on the surface of the brain which are bright, which are not present at the top of the brain, as you can see, nor on the right side of the picture. Uh, but, and then you can see uh, that uh, it spreads in uh, along what are called perivascular spaces, and you can see uh, on the, um, the lower of the two pictures, um, uh, it spreads in almost into the middle of the, uh, the brain where the ventricles are. Uh, and then in the lower part of that picture, this is the area of the brain known as the cerebellum. It's actually much more severe. The brightness is greater. And in fact, it actually spreads right in uh, to where the, uh, the ventricle is. And you can see actually some brightness there. Uh, and it even uh, spreads to the other side. On the upper picture, it's rather similar. Uh, again, you can see that it's on the surface of the brain. There is a nodule in the middle of it. I'm sure everyone can see that circular area, which is brighter than, uh, than everywhere else. And then it settles back down into the normal gray structures of the brain. But then you can see that there are these um, uh, uh, areas um, uh, adjacent to blood vessels which are brighter right the way through, which leads then to another nodule on the inside of the brain on that side. It's the right side of the brain, but the left side of the scan, uh, where in which it is um, um, uh, brighter again uh, on the surface of the inside of the, of the brain. So this is much more serious. Uh, patients get uh, a headache, they get drowsing, they get what are called spreading neurological signs, so it rather depends in, in, in uh, uh, patients such as I've shown you with these scans, they would have numbness and weakness, they might have seizures, uh, they definitely get a drowsiness and a difficulty with, uh, with cognitive processing. The condition known as hydrocephalus um, uh, involves the de development of pressure within the brain, which can be very severe and require urgent um, uh, treatment. So this is an emergency. Um, and uh, it can happen at the beginning of the disease. Uh, and so neurologists can sometimes have to diagnose the condition or it can happen um, uh, after the disease has been diagnosed um, uh, already uh, with respiratory or um, uh, liver symptoms, for example. Intravenous steroids are uh, extremely important. They need to be followed by high dose um, uh, steroid tablets then because the low dose would not clear this in any way. And you have to start suppressing the immune system um, um, straight away. It's not going to settle down just with steroids on its own. Uh, we sometimes use intravenous um, uh, suppression uh, with chemotherapy, uh, but nowadays it would be much better uh, using infliximab because the chemotherapy usually just um, uh, uh, delays things, improves things for a while, uh, but the condition can come back again, whereas infliximab treats it properly uh, and clears uh, the, the treatment um, uh, hopefully uh, forever, uh, although it does take um, uh, two or three years uh, before we can start to reduce down uh, the treatment. But if we use um, high-dose uh, oral immune suppression with infliximab, it means that the patient needs uh, to expose themselves to much lower doses of steroids uh, in the long term. And this obviously has very important effects uh, preventing uh, putting on weight, preventing uh, the development of diabetes, preventing a, 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 um, a change in their uh, appearance, uh, the development of blood pressure, uh, the development of osteoporosis, and all of these other uh, you know, dreadful complications of, of steroids. But the steroids, you see, are essential, as I mentioned already, uh, and so we have to use them. But if we can limit them by gaining uh, access uh, to alternative treatments which have fewer side effects, uh, then it's a much safer uh, a way of uh, treating the patients. Next slide, please, Leo. So this is this pachymeningitis that I, I have mentioned. You can see on the scans that it's, it's the lining of the brain. The brain is much less affected. So the, the brain itself doesn't get inflamed, but it gets squashed by the inflammation which develops um, in the, um, uh, the lining of the, the brain. And so you can see the two main brain scans uh, show it. There's, the top one is at the back of the brain where it pushes the brain forward. Uh, and uh, uh, it, 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 you, 
people like me can see that um, uh, that the uh, the left side of the brain, but the right side of the picture, um, the the other parts of the brain are slightly squashed uh, compared with the uh, this, the side of the brain on the left side. Uh, the lower picture, uh, the brain isn't squashed at all, thank goodness. Uh, but you can see that uh, the inflammation uh, is right the way around. Uh, both sides goes in and then it comes out and then it goes round to the other side. And so that patient presented with headache but without any other symptoms. The headache didn't go away until we treated the, uh, the condition. And then the, uh, the scan on the, um, uh, the right then is obviously a spinal cord and about halfway down you can see uh, that there is an inflammation of the dura pressing onto the spinal cord causing problems with um, uh, bladder function, uh, weakness of the legs and uh, numbness of the legs as well. Uh, so it tends to be more indolent, it tends to be quieter in onset, it's often been there probably for many, many months before it's even recognised. Headache is the predominant symptoms. Uh, you can get focal neurological signs depending on where uh, the disorder arises. Seizures are occasional, but hydrocephalus and this kind of destruction of the brain uh, that happens with leptomeningitis tends not to occur. Steroids work well, but um, uh, it would take it takes years for it all to settle. You just can't use steroids on their own. Uh, you would have to use very, very high doses for a long, long, long time uh, for it to settle down. So immune suppression needs to be started straight away. Uh, infliximab uh, is helpful for this condition, um, but um, it's not essential. Most people do settle down uh, with uh, uh, tablets on their own. Methotrexate in particular is good for this kind of condition. I use infliximab. Um, if there is uh, no response uh, to uh, the condition, um, if it is particularly severe, or if there is only a very slow response, or if it tends to relapse as we reduce the steroids down despite maximal um, uh, immune suppression. But it can take over five years uh, before apachymeningitis resolves in entirety. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. So this is the kind of the new subcategory, um, uh, really, um, uh, vasculitis. Um, um, I think I'm seeing it more and more only because it's being um, understood uh, more and more. Uh, this MRI scans are showing things up in much greater detail. Um, and um, uh, it, it, it we're understanding it uh, more and so we're understanding the treatment of it more as well. So I thought I'd explain the uh, the four um, uh, pictures that I, I've shown. If we start on the, the top right hand corner, uh, this is just a regular kind of um, stroke uh, of the part of the brain known as the cerebellum uh, and that's due to a blockage of uh, a blood vessel in exactly the same way as any other stroke would occur in people who've got cholesterol problems or diabetes or who smoke cigarettes or who have uh, long-standing high blood pressure for example. It doesn't look any different on, on, the, uh, on that scan uh, as it would uh, to anyone uh, else but this person had the stroke uh, despite uh, being young, having normal blood pressure, never having smoked a cigarette in his life, uh, and not having any family history or cholesterol problems or anything like that. Uh, the one below that then is a brain uh, uh, hemorrhage. Uh, it um, uh, uh, occurs uh, whenever the blood vessels are inflamed and um, it's, it, although you can get what's called a subarachnoid hemorrhage which is very uncommon which can be more severe uh, these um, uh, hemorrhages tend to be small uh, they tend to occur in the cerebellum or in the frontal region we call them intraparenchymal uh, hemorrhages uh, and they occur not because um, a blood vessel bursts in the way that other brain hemorrhages can occur which is obviously very serious uh, but uh, whenever um, uh, the uh, small blood vessels under low pressure um, uh, leak uh, blood uh, and the the um, uh, the next um, uh, sorry not the next slide Leo but the next uh, uh, slide on the left of the um, um, uh, the scan that I'm referring to with the big arrow on it um, this is a, a biopsy specimen where you can actually see a blood vessel. The blood vessel is the bit surrounded by the kind of greeny browny um, uh, coloured cells. Uh, there's then blood inside, uh, but then the integrity of the blood vessel wall has been breached by the inflammation coming in uh, from the, um, uh, the 
um, uh, the granulomatous inflammation from the uh, lining of the brain. Um, and so then a little bit of blood leaks out um, and causes the, the hemorrhage. It causes some unpleasant symptoms, often there's a sudden headache and you would get um, uh, um, symptoms um, uh, of whatever part of the brain the, the, um, the hemorrhage occurs in. You get other symptoms as well. You get TIAs uh, and they can be stuttering as well. So the TIAs uh, can come. A TIA obviously is something which we get a neurological impairment, loss of vision, uh, numbness down one side, weakness down one side, difficulty talking, all of these kinds of things which can occur and then go away and then can occur and then go away, but they can increase and increase and increase. And crucially, um, uh, uh, Whenever people have um, TIAs due to uh, uh, blood pressure or smoking, for example, we, we give an aspirin tablet and, and the aspirin usually settles things down. Aspirin doesn't work for uh, TIAs due to sarcoidosis because there's nothing wrong with the blood flow. It's all to do with the fact that the blood vessel is inflamed. So the last brain scan uh, on the, and the biggest brain scan on this slide uh, shows this. Um, uh, and you can see uh, that there is inflammation on both sides of the brain. It's, this is a particularly severe example. But if you look uh, in the middle of the scan, you can see those kind of little sort of wavy um, uh, lines. These are blood vessels extending from the surface of the brain inside. Uh, they're on both sides. It's less on the right side of the um, uh, slide uh, than on the left, as you can see, uh, but it affects um, uh, both sides. And there's also inflammation on the lining of the brain, as you can see uh, on, uh, on both sides. And so this is inflammation of blood vessels. Um, and uh, we have seen this uh, on occasions in people, you know, in the olden days who've ended up having autopsies because the doctors weren't sure what uh, was wrong with them before they died. Um, uh, so we have seen that this occurs, but we've only recently been able to start seeing it uh, whenever we've looked for it um, in, um, uh, in the up-to-date modern MRI scans uh, at high field strength. So uh, this can occur um, uh, on its own. Uh, or with a leptomeningitis. So not everybody who has strokes has the, uh, the kind of picture that I'm showing with the largest of the four um, uh, pictures that I, I've shown there. Um, and sometimes the brain looks absolutely normal, uh, uh, only that the stroke or the hemorrhage is there. Uh, and that is because the blood, only the blood vessels are involved and you don't get a meningitis alongside it. Uh, my feeling is that, uh, that this is um, as severe as a leptomeningitis uh, is, and then it should be treated as aggressively um, uh, as um, a leptomeningitis is. So that would be with high-dose steroids intravenous at the beginning and then oral tablets after that, immediate uh, institution of treatment with immune suppression uh, drugs, and then probably also infliximab as well. And so far this year, I've treated three people under these circumstances with infliximab, and happily, they've responded very nicely. So I think think that is going to be the right form of treatment uh, for this particular subtype of the, uh, the condition. Uh, next slide, please, Leo. Ha, huh. okay. <laughs> my neurologist says I can't have neurosarcoidosis because my scans are normal. I'm hoping people are smiling at this. I see a lot of people who are, have this um, um, story. But let me tell you that uh, there are two things, really. Um, uh, not everybody with neurosarcoidosis has an abnormal brain scan, particularly um, if a, the condition relapses after a treatment. So the brain scan can be normal uh, at the beginning and remain normal, or it can deteriorate and become normal, or it can be abnormal at the beginning and then settle down with treatment. But then as a relapse occurs, it, it doesn't necessarily become abnormal again. This is particularly uh, common in people with spinal cord disease uh, and with cranial neuropathies. And as I mentioned at the beginning, 50% uh, of those with cranial neuropathies um, uh, may have normal scans, but actually whenever you look at the spinal fluid, you can see that there is inflammation within the spinal fluid. Similarly, uh, with spinal cord uh, disease uh, as well. And particularly, there's a particular subtype of spinal cord disease in which it doesn't develop as a sudden thing, like a myelitis, for example, uh, where it's rather obvious that something bad has developed. It can quietly and gradually uh, uh, develop and deteriorate, um, uh, and it doesn't necessarily um, show up uh, any abnormalities on the scan. Um, and this is a worrying uh, 
uh, aspect to this, uh, particularly if contrast isn't uh, given, then uh, some people who've got a mixture of what we call upper motor neuron signs and lower motor neuron signs in whom other symptoms like sensory symptoms uh, don't necessarily develop, you can develop a condition which looks exactly like uh, uh, a motor neuron disease. Um, or ALS as they call it in America, uh, well we call it that here too, um, uh, and then uh, it's possible that patients with sarcoidosis uh, can be misdiagnosed with motor neuron disease and wouldn't therefore be able to, to gain access to treatment which would um, uh, improve or at the very least prevent it from progressively deteriorating and leading uh, to death for example. There's another uh, uh, condition which is exceedingly uncommon. I've only seen it four or five times, but it's, it, it's terribly interesting um, uh, in, in which you develop a progressively worsening uh, encephalopathy. So that's drowsiness, um, uh, neurological symptoms, which often vary, uh, loss of speech one day, and then sensory disturbances another, and then weakness, which then gets better on its own, and seizures which occur, which then settle down. Nothing shows up on the brain scan. I've uh, um, seen three people in whom we've actually uh, had to um, uh, do um, uh, uh, brain biopsies uh, because we haven't been able to diagnose the condition uh, through other means uh, in whom uh, there are very florid um, signs of sarcoidosis uh, in the brain which don't show up on, on brain scans. And these people um, um, uh, improve very well with, uh, with, with treatment. Uh, I've had people uh, with seizures who have been unconscious, for example, who are now walking around, talking, feeling much, much better uh, with hardly any residual um, symptoms um, uh, in whom we've had to give a lot of treatment to get them better. So these uh, uh, more mild cases uh, can occur uh, as well. Um, and, um, uh, and people who've got neurological symptoms and signs, um, if um, uh, the scans are normal, then it's usually worthwhile looking at the spinal fluid as well. We often get clues that there is uh, uh, a sign of inflammation there. Uh, and then uh, people uh, with the more mild forms of the condition uh, involving the spinal cord, for example, or involving the, uh, the brain, um, uh, then if we restage the disease and then escalate or reintroduce treatment, patients usually respond to it quite nicely. I think there's one more slide, uh, Leo, about uh, neuropathy. Four minutes to talk about neuropathy. Um, so uh, neuropathy is not uh, common as I've uh, mentioned as well. There are various different types which have been attributed to sarcoidosis. We don't always see abnormalities compatible with sarcoidosis um, if we do a nerve biopsy for example, but all of these different types can occur. So uh, a large fiber sensory neuropathy is, is numbness of the hands and the feet which spreads up the legs. A large fiber sensory motor neuropathy does the same thing but often causes some weakness of the toes and sometimes of the, of the fingers leading to loss of dexterity. Neither becomes particularly severe um, and it's usually not a, a big deal or a worsening kind of problem for the majority of cases. Mononeuritis occurs as well. It can be multiplex, which means uh, lots of different nerves can be affected or it can be single. So you can get uh, a wrist drop, for example, or weakness of the, uh, of the uh, uh, hand muscles or difficulty with lifting the, uh, the um, the foot up, for example, a foot drop as well. These things usually settle uh, quite nicely uh, just with, uh, with um, steroid treatment. Uh, again, we restage the disease. Uh, and if we feel that the, uh, the underlying disease is, um, uh, is inadequately treated, then we either add in um, uh, an immune suppressive agent or we increase the strength of it or we use a stronger one, or we make an adjustment to the steroids. And the symptoms usually um, settle down. They don't always improve, but they usually stop getting worse. Small fibre neuropathy is an under-recognised um, uh, condition. A lot of people get very uh, painful burning feelings in, their, in their, uh, the soles of their feet and the tips of their fingers. And without treatment, that can worsen. Uh, about 50% of people have additional problems as well with autonomic symptoms, 
uh, either with uh, with easy uh, fainting um, uh, uh, spells or lightheadedness whenever you stand up, or difficulty with digestion as well as slowing down of the colon, or a difficulty with emptying uh, the stomach as well. And these symptoms are often very poorly recognized, particularly by uh, uh, neurologists. Uh, but they again can be um, uh, stabilized uh, with treatment. We, we can't always get them better, uh, but we certainly can uh, prevent them from getting worse. Small fibre neuropathy with pain, uh, we can of course treat with, um, uh, with anti-neuropathic agents, um, uh, um, often uh, uh, epileptic or migraineous kind of drugs, uh, which, which uh, help the symptoms as well. So that's a run uh, through the main uh, categories and the kind of treatments that we give and, and the reasons why we give certain treatments to um, uh, some people and not to others. It all depends on the severity and on what we think uh, uh, the patients will respond to. Uh, we then try uh, escalating the treatment. If that doesn't work or if we don't feel there's a, a, an adequate response, then we'll escalate further. We may add in other, uh, other drugs. And so that's how we uh, treat uh, the, the symptoms of, um, of neurosarcoidosis. Thank you.